Hi, this is Kendra from Redgate's Advocate Team. I'm going to show you in this video how once you have an Azure SQL database in source control with Azure DevOps, you can set up a build and continuous integration for a pipeline. What I've got here is I have an Azure SQL database. I'm using this database called Azure Demo as my development environment. I have already created a project in Azure DevOps in an organization I already had. I use SQL change automation to get this into version control, and then I pushed it up to the repo. And one thing to know about SQL change automation is I do have basically a local build available to me. As a developer on my local machine, I have this verify tab here. So if I'm making changes and I'm editing migration scripts, which I can do, I can uh, verify the code that I've added is correct. So that's really, really nice. But I also, I want to be able to validate these changes in a build situation as well. So let's go to my version control tab and let's simulate that I'm a developer who wants to make a change. I'm going to, if I'm using a pull request workflow, I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna create a branch because I wanna do work in a dedicated branch and then push it up to the central repo and create a pull request saying, hey, I'd like some feedback on this. Does this look like it's ready to merge into a major code line? So I click create branch there and I'm gonna name my branch features and let's name it um, adding column simple there. This UI now says, this is actually something we recently changed based on user request. We had a user who said, when I create a new branch, I'd like it to be really clear in this window that what the new branch is going to be based off of. So since I was already in the master branch, it defaults to creating this off master. And it is very, very clear about that in this window. So we can see what branch I'm in up there as well. I create this and it changes me now into this new branch. In my development database, let's say that I want to add a new column to the doggos table. So I'm gonna, I, I could do this in T-SQL, I could do this in the editor. Let's say I wanna use the graphical editor and I wanna add a column named last modified date. And I'm gonna make this a date time to uh, precision zero column or precision seven. It really thinks that should be seven. So that's fun. <laughs> I'm gonna click control S which makes Management Studio save this change. I could also be working in Visual Studio if I wanted to. And then to get this into version control, I'm gonna click Generate Migrations. You know, I might have multiple changes that I do when I generate the migrations all at once. That's totally fine, but I've just done one. And it shows me down here that on the left is the code in my development database. On the right is the current code in version control. And we can just review here that what we've done is we've added this column with these data types and that we don't have that column in version control. So I'm gonna generate a migration script for this and it gives it a default name. If I want to rename this migration script, I can go here and I can rename. And I think one of the cool things about this tool is let's say I just uh, do the rename wrong. It, let's say I tried to remove the number from that. This, this is a simple thing, but I think it's actually really helpful. It lets me know that there is a required format and it lets me know what the format is. We need numbers and then an underscore and then my the name we want dot SQL. Other tooling may not do this. It's very, very nice when it bubbles up the exact name you want for this. So I'm gonna say, you know, adding last modify date to doggos. If I want, you know, and I misspelled that there, but we'll just pretend I didn't. If I want to edit the migration script, I can open it. I can reformat this with SQL prompt. If I have a preferred format that I want to apply, I just did control K, control Y. I could also, if I wanted to set a default value to this based maybe even on a continual logic, I could add in an update statement. I could say update dbo dot, um, SQL prompt is trying to help me, but uh, typing in a, a demo, I do manage to even uh, defy SQL prompt sometimes. I could do an update statement in there and say, set last modified to this value if another column equals this. You know, I could have case statements in there. I could do all sorts of things. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, what if I make a mistake, right? I just saved this script, but I just put update in there and I, I didn't complete it. Now I could use my local, my verify tab here to build this locally. And it says, by the way, <laughs> that's not the right syntax there. Uh, you should correct that. And I get a handy little link 
that'll help open up the file if I want to do that. So I should have a valid update statement in there. I will just put a comment in there because one of the changes you might actually do is you might want to put comments in there about what you're doing, why this work is being done, all that kind of thing. So once I'm ready to check in, I can go to version control and I can say, you know, adding column to doggos table and I can commit this change. And then I can push the branch up to my repo. Now I'm going to hold off on pushing the branch up because I want, let's, I want to build to run up there. So here I am in my repo. I'm in the Azure demo repo. And I want to set up some automated build tech. So let's, uh, come on, Azure, you can do it. There we go. I'm going to go over here to my pipelines tab and I want to create my first pipeline. I want to create a build pipeline here. You can use the classic editor to create a pipeline without YAML if you choose. We have graphical extensions. I'm going to show you what these look like in a YAML pipeline, but if you want to use the classic editor, there is no shame in that. But I'm going to go ahead and just say I want to do this top one and create a YAML pipeline just to show you how it works in YAML if you like to create this kind of pipeline. So select a repository. I uh, only have one repository in this project. It is the Azure demo one. And I'm gonna do a starter pipeline. Now in my starter pipeline, it will just load a few sample steps. And it wants to know what pool I want to use to build. And the sample it does there is an Ubuntu latest. I actually want to use a, you can use a default pool if you want. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and use, I have an existing pool of local agents, um, and I've named the pool build. I'm just showing you that you can do that. A lot of people do use local agent built. And if you're trying this out, it, there's a lot of free plans you can use to try out Azure DevOps. You can get more mileage out of your free plan if you're telling it, hey, go ahead and build. And so I'm just actually having it build on my local agent that is my virtual machine here um, itself. So it just makes it quite easy for me. And then if I want to show you the build running, it's real easy if I want to run it in interactive mode. In the steps here, it gives us some default steps. And I'm going to go ahead and delete these and add one step of my own. So I'm leaving the word steps there. It's important to leave the word steps there. But I'm going to use the assistant over here on the right to add in a red gate build step. So when you're looking at uh, which extension do you want to use, I tend to just type REDG to get our build and release tasks up. We want for the continuous integration one, build and test with SQL change automation. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And the way this works is that I can use the graphical extension over here on the right to fill out what I want. And then I can have it um, just write the YAML for me and populate the YAML on the left. So my SQL change automation project, this is what is the name of the .sql proj file I want to build. And in this case, it's Azure Demo. If you aren't certain or you don't remember what you named it, you can always open your repo in a new tab and just navigate through and be like, OK, what did I name my SQL proj? You just want the file name. You don't need the .sql proj file on this. So it's named Azure Demo. And then output NuGet package ID. From the build, we're going to output an artifact that contains all of the information about the built database, right? And we can pass this on for deployment. So what is it we want to deploy? It's in this NuGet package artifact. So how do I want to label that is really what this question is. I'm going to name it Azure, label it Azure Demo. So my artifacts will have that in the name. For my temporary server type, I want to build against a SQL server. And I want to build against my Azure, an Azure SQL database, SQL server. So I'm going to say I want to, I'm just getting this so I can copy it to the clipboard. I want to use that server name to build against. It makes sense to build against an Azure DevOps database for an Azure DevOps database, right? Because you want to make sure, does this code compile and run properly against the same kind of database I'm going to deploy to. Now, the database name I want to use is called build. You do need, if you're building this for an Azure SQL database, you do need to create the Azure SQL database in advance. And then I'm going to go ahead and pop in my authentication information here. Now, I don't want to show you my password for this, and I don't want to have my password just stored in plain text in my pipeline. So I'm going to click on variables up here. And I'm going to say, 
I want to do a new variable. This lets me store values or encrypted secrets separately from the repo. I'm going to name my variable. You can name it whatever, but it's kind of normal to name it PW for password. And I'm going to say, keep it secret. And then I'm going to go ahead and paste my password into there. As you can see, my password is all dots. Okay, that's not actually my password. If you click keep this value secret, it will hide your password in there. And then I think this is really handy. It tells you, it didn't use, for non-YAML pipelines, this isn't as obvious. It tells you how to reference the variable in a script given the name you've given it and in different kinds of scripts you're doing. So I think that's really, really nice that they put this in there because I have a hard time remembering syntax and it always is one of those things where it's like, oh, how do I reference this? So now I can save my variable and I can put, instead of putting my password in the YAML directly, I can put it here. By default, it will publish the artifact. I want to do that. And then I do want to use the latest version of SQL change automation. And then I like to append the build ID to the NuGet package version. So I'm going to go ahead now, now that I have the, the things I liked, I clicked add. And what add does is it pops all of the info into YAML format automatically. So I don't have to worry about exactly how this is formatted. I just need to make sure it is under the steps location there. And I can go ahead and save this and do a run. So this is my uh, build Azure demo um, commit message. So I'm just going to use that to my uh, use that as my commit message. All right. So now if I go back to pipelines here, it will start up my pipeline. And in my case, if I go and I look in here. I have some authentication or some security issues on my uh, pool. I have my pool set up. If I view this, I have my pool set up so that it doesn't give everyone permission. And it, not all my projects by default have permission to use that build queue. So I have to actually click permit to uh, give my pipeline the ability to use that queue, right? That's just the way I have it set up there. So I only have to do that once and now it has permission to use the queue. This is really, um, the reason I do that is just to show that there's all these different ways that you can set security around pools, right? You are going to want to secure any pools you're using for production differently than Q pools you're using for dev. And there are many different ways that you can do that security so that not just any random pipeline can run against production. You don't want accidents to happen, right? So you want to use uh, security on these pools because a lot of the benefits of security is honestly protecting me against future me who forgot what she was doing. <laughs> So <laughs> there's other reasons for security too, but it can help out with this as well. So right now our build job has started and this is just building the master branch. This is just building my initial check-in of what I've got in the master branch here and making sure that everything builds right there. So while this is running, I do want to say, okay, I want builds to run automatically for pull requests that happen. And to do this, I'm going to click on the branches tab in repos and go to the master branch here. And it does say a build for this is in progress, but I want to set up a branch policy. So I click on that dot, dot, dot here on the right. Let's zoom for this. If you click on dot, dot, dot here on the right, we want to way at the bottom of this menu. Let's see if I can get the zoom working here. We want to click on branch policies there. So uh, we're going to create a policy for this branch. And we're going to add a build policy to it. The build policy says if anyone wants to, nobody can make changes to this branch by default. You need to have a build be successful. So I'm saying the build pipeline Azure demo needs to run for things to merge into master. And I want this to trigger automatically. So I'm going to name this um, master policy for Azure demo, right? Save that. And now this is a required thing. So now pull requests will automatically kick off this build. If I want to automatically include code reviewers, I can do that and all sorts of things on this as well. Looking back at our pipeline, I can see that the initial run of my pipeline succeeded just on the master branch itself. So now I want to go ahead and push, I, I down here already on my dev machine, 
I already have some changes in my features adding column branch. So I'm going to push that up to my repo and it will push that branch up. If I now go over here to, I'm just going to go to my repos tab and click on branches, we can see that I have my feature branch here adding column. And it suggests very helpfully, perhaps you want to create a pull request. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and create a pull request and click create there. Now I can review here the files that were changed in my pull request and all sorts of things. But the cool thing about this is automatically in creating my pull request, because I created that branch policy and associated it with my build, it's like, oh, we need to make sure this build is successful. So just in case I didn't run verify or I forgot and verify was, you know, just in case I worked an error into my scripts without realizing it, this will uh, make sure that my code builds successfully. Also, if I want to add T-SQL t-tests into my build and make sure that I'm following the patterns that are required in my code, you can also do that as well and set those to run as part of the build. Very, very cool. This is the basics of setting up branches and continuous integration here. There is one last thing I want to note though. If we look at the files that were modified as part of my change, I created a migration script, you know, that is doing an alter table. I actually didn't do anything. Notice that there's a file named doggos.sql that knows about the last modified date column here, right? And it knows that there used to be a comma here um, or there used to not be a comma on new call, right? Because it used to be the last column in the table and now it does have a column. This doggos.sql file, I didn't change that. Behind the scenes, SQL change automation updates a schema model automatically and it keeps track of the state of your tables. This is done so that if someone else has made a change to the doggos file and it's already been merged to the master branch, like after I pull, after I created my branch, if something else changed that, since I knew about it, it can alert me when I do the pull request, it can alert me, hey, there's a merge conflict because someone else has changed this object. In other words, SQL change automation is a way that lets me control the T-SQL by crafting the T-SQL in my migrations, but it also behind the scenes keeps track of the state of all the tables so that I will know if there are merge conflicts and if I want to compare uh, my branch to a database, if I want to compare my branch to another branch, it's easy to do that without me having to parse manually through all of my migration scripts. So very, very cool that that happened. And if there was a merge conflict, it would let me know here. So now I've been talking long enough that we can see that my build has completed and that it was successfully, as well as the fact that we have no merge conflicts. So I can get a review from this. I can get things approved. I allow myself to approve my own changes. Maybe that's not for the best. And then I can complete my merge into the master code branch. This has been an overview of how you can set up continuous integrations and build for Azure SQL database using SQL change automation. I'm Kendra from Redgate's advocate team. I'll see you again in another video soon. Bye folks.